night, all the president's men and women, Republicans flocked to downtown New York to show their loyalty. How the road show became a bigger show than the trial. Last best hope. I think that Michelle Obama would hands down be the next president of the United States. New calls to draft Michelle Obama. Is there still time to make this dream come true? And family values. My beautiful wife, Isabel, would be the first to say that her life truly started when she began living her vocation as a wife and as a mother. The Kansas City Chiefs star who put the NFL in a bind. Can the league call out a player who praises his wife for being a mom? Welcome to the Ferris Show on television. First tonight, for as much as certain members of the media hate Donald Trump, and they do, and hate's a strong word, but it is true for many, and they're scornful of him and scornful of his followers. Those members of the media care a lot more about their own egos. It's more important for them to be right and break the bad news to their viewers than keep up the charade that Trump will go to jail. That happened today. It was a sea change. Two CNN hosts and one MSNBC anchor finally admitted what we have been telling you all along. Not because we like or dislike Donald Trump, because we just have to tell you. It's our job to tell you the facts, to call things as we see them. And here it is. And here's what those anchors realized today. The New York case against Donald Trump is a loser for the prosecution. It's a loser for a number of reasons, but primarily because the star witness is an admitted felon and liar. That became apparent today to the jury during the cross-examination of Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen. For me, even with my strong feelings about Donald Trump, my knowledge of how he behaves, I couldn't today convict beyond a reasonable doubt. If there is reasonable doubt, it might have very well been raised Tuesday and today with Mr. Cohen. I think if I was a juror in this case watching that, I would think this guy's making this up as he's going along, or he's making this particular story up. Attorneys for Donald Trump grilled Cohen, and they are not done yet. The defense painted Cohen as a known liar who is hell-bent on getting back at his former boss, and there is a lot of evidence to support that. Jurors heard this key piece of evidence, and this is a clip of Cohen speaking on his podcast back in 2020. I truly f-ing hope that this man ends up in prison. It won't bring back the year that I lost or the damage done to my family, but revenge is a dish best served cold. And you better believe I want this man to go down and rot inside for what he did to me and my family. Hmm. Attorneys also argued Cohen is upset at Trump for not giving him a job at the White House. That was widely reported. They pressed Cohen on whether or not he sought a pardon from Trump, which he initially denied. It took five hours of cross-examination before they even got to the payment of Stormy Daniels. But at every turn, Trump's attorney succeeded in portraying Cohen as a shady person seeking vengeance, not some soothsayer of the truth. The searing cross-examination is going to be top of mind for jurors all weekend. Court's out tomorrow. But Cohen retakes the stand first thing Monday morning with us now, Michael Desharo, former assistant district attorney in New York City, Katie Tra- Kasky, former federal prosecutor who now practices criminal defense in New York. Her book is Woke Warriors, How the Left is Destroying America's Ability to Fight and Win Its Wars. Um, Michael, I want to start with you on this because ever since this case was brought, from the very first day the indictment came down, you were on TV and all you've talked about for a year plus is today. Did it live up to your expectations? Absolutely. Michael Cohen is a cross-examiner's dream. And Mr. Blanche and that team took the time to go through everything. Every statement, every podcast, every TikTok live where he's wearing, where Cohen is wearing a jail Trump t-shirt. The problem for the prosecution is this. If you have to believe anything that Cohen says, because what they are going to argue is we have all this corroboration. Okay, what do you need us to believe from Cohen? We need you to believe X. That will be in doubt. He is walking reasonable doubt. And the big moment today was about a phone call between Cohen and Keith Schiller, who's another Trump uh, fixer, if you will, 
Um, and the phone call was allegedly about Stormy Daniels. That's what Cohen had testified to. And then on cross-examination, Cohen had to admit that it was actually about dealing with some crank phone calls that Cohen had been getting from a 14-year-old, and then he got confused, um, and everything else. This is Anderson Cooper describing that moment about exactly what you do to a witness. And interestingly enough, Michael, it's some of the same words you use. Take a listen. On a cross-examination, uh, lawyers want to kind of put the, the, uh, the witness in a, you know, build a box around the witness and then slam it shut. That's what Todd Blanche did to, to Michael Cohen. All right, Katie, uh, what do the prosecutors do now? Well, Michael Cohen is essentially a trifecta of a nightmare for prosecutors because he has the credibility issues, he has the bias issues, and then he's making uncorroborated statements that arguably relate to the charges. So it really never mattered what he said because none of it could ever have been believed. That was the bottom line with Cohen. The problem that the prosecution has is that they do not have evidence on the actual elements of the charged offenses, Michael Cohen was essentially the only person that they had to try to tie Donald Trump to even making this deal, let alone trying to argue that it was somehow criminal. I think the only thing the prosecution could do is throw up some sort of accounting expert to say that the documentation of these reimbursements as legal expenses was somehow improper. But they're not going to do that. So I don't know how they even establish the misdemeanor offense here. The case is, is essentially over. I'll be shocked if Cohen even shows up on Monday. I don't know why he would at this point. Well, when you say he, I mean, he would show up because otherwise he would be He's subpoenaed, ordered right? to. But it's a it's a bit of a embarrassment, needless to say. So certainly the prosecution well, can't uh, do much. This was their witness, and he's uh, not able to close the loop for them on the evidentiary elements. Embarrassment is not something that has stopped Michael Cohen um, in the past, Michael Desharo. Uh, how important is it that this was on the last day of court for the week? And the jurors go home for, for three days for a long weekend. I know they're not supposed to talk about the case. They're not supposed to read anything about the case. But, you know, there's families. People are out at bars. They see things. They hear things. And this is what everybody's talking about. Absolutely. How can you get away with it? There, there's 170 million Americans on TikTok. Everybody's got family. Everybody's got friends. You can't turn on any news channel without hearing this. And all they're going to think about all weekend is... A guy who's on the stand, who despises the defendant, has told a million different stories, and this may open the door for the defense to bring in Mr. Costello, which is Michael Cohen's old lawyer, because Michael Cohen waived the privilege. All right, so that is Robert Costello, who you're talking about, a former federal uh, prosecutor uh, from Manhattan, uh, which, Katie, is, I believe, where you might have practiced law. Let's take a listen. I said, Michael, the way this works is if you have truthful information about Donald Trump, that's clearly what they're looking for. I can have all your legal problems solved by the end of the week. His response, I swear to God, Bob, I don't have anything on Donald Trump. Katie, how significant is testimony like that? And Michael made the point of maybe, maybe it would open the door for that. Why would, if he was able to say it in front of a House committee and he's able to say it on TV today, Robert Costello was, why couldn't he say it in court? Well, the defense may very well call him, and it's absolutely devastating to Cohen's testimony as, as if they needed anything else to nail the coffin on that one. Not only does C Costello's testimony devastate Michael Cohen's credibility even further, but he has made allegations that he was not allowed to share very relevant information with the grand jury in this case as well. So certainly the defense has an incentive to introduce some of that evidence, and it's, it's not going to be anything but an, an, an annihilation for them even further. All right. Um, there is there is another side to this, right, is that there is a, a lot of people we talked started by talking about the media, but there's a lot of uh, voters, celebrities, whatever, who believe Donald Trump is guilty of something. If, if he's such a bad person, he must have done bad things and they want to see him convicted. That sort of seemed where Anthony Scaramucci was going uh, when he was on the program a couple of days ago. Take a listen. Question is, is he guilty? Is Donald Trump guilty of improper use of campaign finance money and hiding something that, it, that needed to be disclosed uh, prior to that presidential election? And I think he'll probably be guilty. But, but, of but he's, things, he, that's but, not what he's charged me, with. He's charged with falsifying business records. 
Not so, not disclosing so, it. Exactly. Oh, 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 okay. So whatever he's being charged with, Leland, the facts are there. He's guilty of what's being charged. That's my opinion. Michael, there's the question, right? Whatever he uh, is charged with, he must be guilty. The facts, quote unquote, are there. Assuming that the jury does its job and they're not just there to convict Donald Trump, what facts must be there? That Donald Trump intended to violate the law, that he intended to make these entries, direct these entries in order to violate a separate law. And we we still don't we're still not there. And for Michael, for Mr. Scaramucci to say that, who's a Harvard lawyer, charge of anything, I, I hope that's not the case. I understand that only 12% of Manhattan voted for Donald Trump, but these jurors are going to get a jury instruction. The judge is going to read them the law unless the judge dismisses the case. And I hope that they follow the law and the facts. And let's not forget, there are two attorneys on this panel who are probably looking at Michael Cohen like they wouldn't even touch him with a stick. Yeah, well, uh, attorneys don't like disbarred attorneys um, because obviously, um, uh, you know, they they, they cause problems uh, for good attorneys. Uh, Katie, Michael, thank you very much. We appreciate both of your time. We'll talk soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The scene outside the courthouse was something else, too. And we actually have pictures of that. No cameras inside the courtroom. The Trump traveling entourage grows by the day. So, yes, it's a sign of party unity. Is it also a lineup for who will soon be betrayed by Donald Trump? And one pro football star told graduates to be men, respect their wives, and honor traditional values. Why the NFL has an issue with that. Some of you may go on to lead successful careers in the world, but I would venture to guess that the majority of you are most excited about your marriage and the children you will bring into this world. We watched Michael Cohen get dog walked through the series of lies he has told. We saw the perjurer in chief, Michael Cohen, multiple times admit and acknowledge that he has lied under oath. Mr. Cohen admitted repeatedly that he lied. We have a convicted felon who has a vengeance against the president. He can't wait for President Trump to be locked up behind bars. Someone who wears a shirt with President Trump behind bars. If you just step back for a second, they're showing loyalty to a man, Trump. On the day testimony from the man who went to jail for being loyal to Trump, that is, Michael Cohen, testifies. And Cohen's not the only one who paid a price for his loyalty to Donald Trump. Let's just take a brief trip down memory lane. Jeff Sessions was fired unceremoniously. Steve Bannon likely heading to prison. Mick Mulvaney fired. Roger Stone had his prison sentence commuted. Rudy Giuliani is facing multiple upon multiple indictments. Mike Pence faced threats of being hanged. The list goes on and on and on. Yet the 2024 edition of The Apprentice carries on as so many line up to try out for cabinet jobs and the vice president's role. Victor Davis Hanson is here, senior fellow at the Hoover Institute, author of The End of Everything, How Wars Descend into Annihilation. Uh, Good to see you, sir. I I believe there's a tie into the book that I'm going to get you to, but I want to start with this. Am I being fair to make the point, and I think it's an interesting one, I make it, so of course I think it's an interesting one, that Trump's loyalty uh, only goes one way? You are being fair if you believe that that is he's different from other presidents. So, for example, Eric Holder was very loyal to Barack Obama. And during the Fast and Furious uh, scandal, he was uh, subpoenaed to go to Congress, just like Steve Bannon or Peter Navarro. And he was loyal. He said, I'm the president's wingman. I refuse to testify. And Obama backed him up and they sent a criminal referral and the DOJ refused to prosecute him, unlike the way that they treated Navarro and Bannon. And so the question is, was the media so obsessed with Donald Trump that expressions of loyalty to him that were analogous to other uh, White House staff and and people in the cabinet, say in the Obama, the Bush administrations, was it different? And I think you can make an argument that we have never had a president impeached twice. We've never had one tried as a private citizen. We've never had one 
who they who his opponents tried to take off the ballot. We've never had one where there were statutes of limitations eliminated so that local and state prosecutors, really it's a bill of attainder, went after a, a ex-president leading candidate. So I think we're on new ground where there's no precedence for any of this. But there is a pattern yeah. that if you work for Donald Trump, you're going to receive an obsessive uh, hatred and anger from the left in a way that was not accorded to not only Democratic prior presidents, but also George W. Bush. I mean, they called him a Nazi. They, they did that. They said Mitt Romney uh, tortured dogs and things like that, but they didn't have the same degree of venom. It wasn't as dangerous to work for them, given what the left did. Uh, all fair points, but then you think about how Trump t- treated even, say, Rex Tillerson. Um, the media didn't yeah. bring that upon him. The, the way Donald Trump has treated Mike Pence, the media did not bring that upon Mike Pence. Um, I, I, your point is taken when it comes to other people, but certainly there's been a lot of people who have shown Donald Trump loyalty that Donald Trump has not returned. Well, I think Mike Pence was treated badly because I don't think he was ever in a position to question the electoral process in the way Donald Trump wanted him to. So I think that's a good point that you made. Rex Tillerson, though, was in a fight with Donald Trump from the very beginning. Remember, he said that he wasn't very smart and he was on record of criticizing his own commander in chief as a cabinet officer. And usually when that happens, you're done. For. Yeah, that's, a, that's a fair and, point. The things. Yeah. Things yeah. don't necessarily. So I, I, yeah. But I think you well. made a good point. You made a good point about Mike Pence. I think that he did what he felt that he had to do. And uh, but he didn't. I'm not sure that he paid a big price for it. I mean, he uh, is seen in many parts of the conservative movement as a principled person. He ran for president. Uh, he, he gave he had a fair opportunity. He put his agenda out there for the public. They didn't seem to be okay. receptive to it. But uh, I don't think he suffered much. I mean, it was, it was at the very Fair end enough. of the administration. Yeah. Fair enough. And you, you, you now have this cast, and we did this on Tuesday, uh, of people who are showing up to possibly want to come out and, and be vice president. I'm interested in, in your book, right, The End of Everything, How Wars Descend yeah. into Annihilation. And you've studied um, not only wars, but the men behind wars. And when you get leadership in, in a country... Um, that becomes singularly obsessed with one man, um, almost with cult-like following to him. Um, I'm wondering if that ever ends well. Well, it depends on the system that the person operates. In the cases that I cited, um, Alexander the Great had a cult following, so did Scipio, but Scipio, you know, he was in a constitutional government at Rome, but my point in looking at these people who destroyed these civilizations was they weren't Genghis Khan, they weren't Attila Hun, they were far more dangerous. They were intellectual students of philosophy. Scipio destroyed Carthage while he was talking to the great historian Polybius. And Mehmet destroyed Constantinople, bragging that he had the, the most uh, extensive library in, in the Islamic world. And my point was simply that Take people seriously what, when they say they want to annihilate an antithetical civilization. And don't just say, well, they would never, they wouldn't do it, or somebody's right. going to come and help us at the 11th hour, or we're still as strong as we were 100 years ago. Yeah. And I think it's a warning that there's a lot of people out there today, Kim Jong-un, Putin, Xi, uh, Recep Erdogan, the Iranian theocracy. They've all threatened existentially it's a great point. to destroy, destroy various yeah. nations. We all say can't happen here, but sometimes, well, rarely, but sometimes it does. Yeah, what, Maya Angelou had a line, right? She said, um, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. Uh, so that, that applies. Uh, author of The End of Everything, How Wars Descend in Annihilation, Victor Davis Hanson. Um, thank you. Safe travels. Congrats. New York Times bestseller already uh, on the first thank week. You. We'll see you soon, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me again, David. Yeah, ESPN's Stephen A. Smith, an expert on the NBA draft, now thinks it's time for Democrats to draft someone on the top of the ticket who's already lived in the White House. What would happen if Michelle Obama ran for president and some of Hollywood's biggest stars demand a return of canceled actor Kevin Spacey? Is there a double standard or should Spacey just get a second chance? 
Well, this weekend, President Biden will speak at Morehouse College, a historically black institution. Today, he spoke with plaintiffs of the Brown versus the Board education case and their family members to honor the 70th anniversary of the ruling that integrated public schools in America. The events and others come while Mr. Biden is losing his favorability among black voters. In 2020, his favorability among black men was 87 percent. Now it's down to 57 percent, a 30 point drop. His rating among black women, 93 in 2020. That's now down to 77 percent. Some big time liberals think, well, perhaps Mr. Biden is a lost cause for 2024 and would love it if Democrats would draft someone else. ESPN's Stephen A. Smith is the newest member of the draft Michelle Obama club. And I think that Michelle Obama would win right now if she would have run. I think that Michelle Obama would hands down be the next president of the United States if she were to run against Trump, um, the presumptive GOP nominee. Now, that obviously is not going to happen. She doesn't seem to have an interest. All right, with us now, News Nation contributor Scott Bolden, Lauren Wright, associate research scholar and lecturer in politics at Princeton University. Welcome. Welcome, Scott. Uh, we'll start with you because you're in studio, and uh, you're going to tell me that he doesn't have a problem with African Americans. <clears throat> I'm saying that he's got a challenge with African Americans right now, but we're six months out. And I'll be honest with you, when you have a binary, uh, uh, a binary choice, binary <laughs> You know what I mean. When you have the choice. Zero or two, one, binary. There, there there binary, go. forgive me. Uh, that in the end, the African-American voters uh, are going to vote for Biden over Trump, but they've got to go to the polls. And Biden's got enough money for Go TV to get him to the polls. And when given that choice, I'm pretty sure those numbers that you put up, they may be down now, but they're going to be where they should be in six months in November. Lauren, just historically and no one group is exactly like other groups. But in terms of polling, has there ever been a time where someone has lost 30 points among a given and critical dem demographic and then been able to regain it as Scott claims is going to happen in six months? Well, I mean, the types of numbers Trump is posting with black men in particular, we haven't seen since Richard Nixon won. And so that should absolutely be an alarm bell to Democrats. I agree with Scott that most African-American voters will ultimately choose Biden. But when you see polling that shows Trump's getting double, triple what he was getting in the exit polls in 2020, that should be concerning. So should the 2022 midterms where Republicans did pretty well among African-Americans. Usually they get five to seven percent of the vote. They got 10 to 14 percent on average. So that should be scary to Democrats. They should be worried. OK, and part of this is in terms of what have you done for me and how much uh, certain groups feel taken for granted. Uh, tomorrow, for example, president receives a presidential daily brief. He delivers remarks at the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. 3.30, he meets with leaders of the historically black sororities called the Divine Nine. Scott Bolden, then you will join him uh, at Morehouse College yeah. uh, in Atlanta for a speech. I think it's fair to say that a lot of black Democrats feel taken for granted by the Biden administration and, and taken for granted by the Democratic Party. How do you convince people in a speech rather than through action that you deserve another four years when in the first four years you didn't get a lot out of them? I'd say a lot of African-Americans, and I can't speak for all African-Americans because we're not a monolithic group, um, feel uh, of some level of neglect. But Americans, because of inflation and from, because of economic challenges, just aren't happy right now with prices. And while the statistics say one thing, those bread and butter issues are saying another thing. There's this emotional uh, disconnect. But it's not the speech that's going to get his numbers up with African-Americans. I don't accept the fact that he's down with African-Americans. That's one poll. That's a snap. Snapshot. I will say this, in politics 101, you got to shore up your base, right? And if he's been neglectful of his base or if he's been focused on other things, you got to shore your base up to win. And he needs black the black vote to do that. He needs the brown vote to do that. He needs uh, gay Democrats to do that. He needs young people to do that. And there's a lot of, uh, there's sections of displeasure with him in regard to the uh, Israeli-Hamas war, yeah. but also the economy. And I just think Americans not, Democrats aren't paying completely attention, but when they start to pay attention, that choice that they're going to make is going to be for Biden. Biden's challenge is to make sure that they get to the polls and they don't stay home. Well, right. And so, Lauren, where where do we draw the line here? And I think it's an interesting distinction, right, between favorability among 
African Americans and whether or not they support Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. Because Scott has a point. When it's a binary choice, that changes things um, from a pollster's question to actually being in the ballot box and I are in the in the voting booth. And I I almost wonder um, if denial here by Democrats isn't more dangerous than going out and aggressively confronting the problem. Well, I actually think we splice it too much. I mean, Scott is absolutely right. Black voters are not a monolith. And the reason that Biden is losing support among them is the same exact reason he's losing support among every other group, which are the top issues that traditionally benefit Republicans, which are immigration, the economy and crime. Those are the those are the issues dragging Biden. And so including this group he is dragging among those voters. And so it would be a mistake, I think, to make such a specific pitch and make such an assumption that this one group of voters is going to put me in the White House without also acknowledging that they're upset about the same stuff everybody else is. That's why they're thinking about Trump or thinking about not turning out. Uh, Good point. I'll tell you another thing. Uh, you got one thing to tell me, got and then we got to run. You. The immigration issue affects the African American community too. That there's this 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 belief that uh, immigration is taking their jobs and reducing okay. their you, economic impact. Th- you got one thought, you got it in, and then we, you set me up for a perfect tease because we're talking about immigration next. Not with really? you. Okay. All right. Thanks. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Lauren. Good to see you um, Bye, thank as you. well. I'm waving at her on the screen. She's actually there. All right. <laughs> Imagine in 2024, there is now a chance that someone can be uncanceled. That's what disgraced movie star Kevin Spacey is trying to do. Kind of feels like 2017 all over again for Spacey. A British documentary has come out, leveling even more charges of sexual misconduct against the already canceled actor. But perhaps lucky for him, in fact, definitely lucky for him, it's not 2017, it's not 2020. This isn't the Me Too era anymore. So this time around, Spacey's getting star support from important friends, actor Liam Neeson, Sharon Stone, and others now all of a sudden want him to be uncanceled. Our industry needs Kevin Spacey somehow. They say he deserves his career back. Neeson released a statement saying, I was deeply saddened to learn of these accusations against him. Kevin is a good man, a man of character. He's sensitive, articulate, and non-judgmental with a terrific sense of humor. Uh Uh-huh. He's also one of the finest artists in the theater and on camera. Personally speaking, our industry needs him and misses him greatly. Real profile and courage there, Liam. Sharon Stone writes, I can't wait to see Kevin back at work. He's a genius. He's so elegant and fun, generous to a fault, and knows more about our craft than most ever will. Wow. Things have changed, haven't they? It's a far cry from most of Hollywood seven years ago after a host of men came forward accusing Spacey of sexual abuse. Netflix dropped him from his starring role in House of Cards. Director Ridley Scott reshot scenes from a whole movie just to cut Spacey out. He hasn't been on screen or on the stage since. So times have changed. But does that mean Kevin Spacey deserves a third act? Cuomo sits down with Kevin Spacey tonight. That is coming up at the top of the hour, 23 minutes from now. As we promised you, President Biden will take action on the southern border. It will not secure the border, we know that. But will it be enough to secure his reelection? Look, these Sun Belt battlegrounds say, frankly, for the Joe Biden campaign, these numbers are an absolute disaster. The smallest lead is in Arizona for Donald Trump. He's up six. Look at this, nine in Georgia, 13 in Nevada. My goodness gracious, my God. Why won't they give me the help? All right. That was President Biden over the past past few months, over and over and over again, saying there was nothing he could do on the border. But elections have a funny way of changing things in presidential politics. So we're now less than six months out from the November presidential election. His approval rating on the border is near freezing levels right now. It is at 36 percent. And now suddenly he says he's going to do something on the border. Whether he likes the policy or agrees with the policy or once called it racist under Donald Trump, he's going to do something. 
According to the New York Post, Biden is planning on issuing an executive order to shut down the border once the crossings reach 4,000 per day. The leak comes on the heels of the White House announcing additional student loan relief, a crackdown on Israel and Gaza, and Chinese tariffs checking off some of the biggest criticism launched at Biden over the past three and a half years. Florida Congressman Brian Mast, member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, is here. Congressman, welcome. Thanks. Glad to have you on set. Great to have you be here. I think we can all agree that this is a political move. Um, We can all agree it's not going to do anything really to secure the border, right? Fair? I would agree. Okay, you agree with both of those. Will it do enough, though, and I think this is the question, that it's going to change the numbers of people coming across enough so that when voters here in September and October, the border numbers are way down, it's going to be enough to help Joe Biden on this issue? No, and I think you're asking a question in an appropriate way. Is polling the authority that he was looking for to secure the border? I think that's part of what you're asking. Is it enough in the end to garner some kind of support? Hey, you did something on the border. He's looking at polling. And the fact of the matter is, I think people do see this isn't the first time he's taking border action. He can't run away from the fact that border action was his campaign promise to undo everything that was Trump border policies. That was going to be his action. He did it. He was warned about it. These are the results. Now he's paying the cost and polling is giving him his new authority. You represent Florida, which is not technically a border state, at least the border with Mexico. You're from Michigan, uh, as I am. It's a border state with Canada where we don't have a huge problem uh, of folks coming across the northern border yet. But in all of these states, people will tell you when you poll them, independence as well, and some Democrats, that immigration is a huge issue. What has immigration become a proxy for that voters are saying is important to them? Cost, debt, where your tax dollars are going, uh, you know, waste, fraud, and abuse, because when you're looking at the border, it's so in your face that you're seeing somebody come across that's not from your country that's going to say, okay, we're going to pay for their food, we're going to pay for their lodging, we're going to pay for their transportation, we're going to pay for their legal fees while they're being adjudicated for the asylum that they're probably not eligible for, and we're going to pay for other things, and then we're going to see them on social media and Instagram and TikTok in other cities, trashing places or bogging down the schools or the, the hospitals, infrastructure, or yeah, it might be. roads, everything else. No, it's, it, it, look, it has become a nationwide problem. Every town is a border town. This, I thought, was an interesting statistic. Mexico, Mexico is now stopping more migrants from entering the United States. 280,000 stopped by Mexico in March. 189 stopped uh, in March of last year. In 2023, Mexico stopped 100,000 per month. This was NBC News pointing out that Mexico is now starting to really crack down here. How much of that do you think is because they would much prefer Joe Biden as president than Donald Trump as president? I look at it more as self-preservation. I think that the presidency, full disclosure, goes to Donald Trump. I chair his veterans campaign, right? That's my disclosure. I chair his veterans campaign. But when you look at that and the the self-preservation for Mexico, policies will change under a President Trump, and they don't want to be caught flat-footed on that. They probably don't want to be in a situation again where they have President Trump come in day one and say, listen, if you don't do this tomorrow, tariffs are going to this. And if it takes you more than 12 hours, then tariffs are going up another 10%. And if it takes 36 hours, it's going up another 10%. They don't want to be in that situation again. Fair enough. Congressman, it's good to see you. Thank you very much. In one of the most heavily guarded and secure places in the world, actually where the congressman works, police found a dangerous white powder. And the most highly trained law enforcement services in the world cannot figure out where it came from. And we've all heard this story before, right? But this time... The cocaine was not in the White House. It was just down Pennsylvania Avenue. The U.S. Capitol Police are trying to figure out who brought a bag of cocaine into their building. The small bag was found on the floor of a hallway inside Capitol Police headquarters. If this story sounds familiar, the Secret Service never did figure out who left cocaine in the White House last summer. This week, Capitol Police said the bag was found on the floor of a hallway inside USCP headquarters. The hallway is on the second floor in an area that has been staging grounds for furniture and supplies. They added the area is heavily trafficked by various contractors and employees, also near offices such as prisoner processing, crime scene, intel, and reports processing. So who knows? Maybe their friends at the Secret Service can help them in their investigation. Of course, the Secret Service investigated who brought cocaine into the White House but could never figure it out. Perhaps the Secret Service could also help the Capitol Police with public relations. After all, the Secret Service did a pretty good job covering up the cocaine story. 
On a Sunday, dispatchers said the substance was found in the library two floors below the private White House residence. The 4th of July week, the White House says the cocaine was near the ground entrance of the West Wing. And on Thursday, July 6th, the White House comes out and claims the drugs were found in a highly secure area of the West Wing near the Situation Room where the vice president parks her car. Eleven days later, quote, at this time, the Secret Service investigation is closed due to a lack of physical evidence. We'll let you know if the U.S. Capitol Police have more success than the Secret Service in finding the cocaine culprit. I'm certain the it happened. The AP could not have imagined that their attempt to a graduation speech extolling family values exposed the NFL's deepest problem. It also set off a heated debate among the NFL's fastest growing group of fans. What women really are thinking about this speech when we come back. The NFL, NFL just disavowed one of its star players, not for beating his girlfriend or cheating or gambling, but for a graduation speech the player made praising his wife. Here's Kansas City Chiefs kicker Harrison Butker. That all of my success is made possible because a girl I met in band class back in middle school would convert to the faith, become my wife, and embrace one of the most important titles of all, homemaker. Raucous applause. The crowd at Benedictine College in rural Kansas loved it. The press in the NFL, not so much. NFL Senior Vice President, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer Jonathan Bean. The NFL is steadfast in our commitment to inclusion, which only makes our league stronger. This is the same NFL that's just fine with other political statements like Black Lives Matters on players' helmets. But praising your wife is a bridge too far. Noelle Fitchett is here, host of Out of Context with Noelle Fitchett, podcast and writer from the Remnant News. Uh, good to see you. Thank you. Um, Look, Benedictine College, Atkinson, Kansas, uh, no one would cover the speech by the Kansas City Chiefs kicker had he not said these things. Why is this one message so, what, triggering, threatening to a group of people? You know, I think it's so wild that it's insanely triggering to lots of people. And I think that's because, you know, had Harrison praised a corporate boss babe or praised women for pursuing some type of career, then it would be fine. There wouldn't be any traditional, more traditional women um, condemning that. But because he praised a more traditional role, because he praised the role that God has designed for women, um, that was met with so much backlash. And it just shows where we are in a society where we don't value motherhood. I think there's an interesting point here, right? And there, it, I think you're, we, we're getting there, but I want to tease it out a little bit more because there's a difference between telling women your place is in the home and celebrating women who choose to be in the home, right? Yes, absolutely. And that's exactly what he did. He never told anyone that they couldn't. He never said to drop out of school. He never said to quit your job. He just praised his wife for the role that she had stepped into and how that's well, hold on, hold on. Just, just, just to be Just to be fair, I agree with you with the first soundbite 100%. Um, but there was another uh, section of his speech that I think may walk up to the line you're talking about. Take a listen. Some of you may go on to lead successful careers in the world but I would venture to guess that the majority of you are most excited about your marriage and the children you will bring into this world. I can tell you that my beautiful wife, Isabel, would be the first to say that her life truly started when she began living her vocation as a wife and as a mother. Okay, so do we just chalk this up to advice from somebody about life that happens at graduations? Yeah, you know, most of the audience in that college campus and during that graduation were Catholic, which tend to be more traditional, which tend to be more conservative. So he was speaking to his audience, and that's why, you know, a lot of the women in that crowd more than likely are their goal is to be a mother and to be a wife. And so he was speaking to his audience. Fair, fair enough. Um, and I think you're right when you say conservative values are under under threat and under attack across America. and. Conservatives tend to attack less and just want to be left alone, progressives the other way. There was an interesting response to this um, 
by none other than Whoopi Goldberg on The View. Take a listen. I like when people say what they need to say. He's at a Catholic college. Yeah. He's a staunch Catholic. These are his beliefs, and he's welcome to them. I don't have to believe them. Right. I don't have to accept them. The ladies that were sitting in that audience do not have to accept them. Same way we want respect when Colin Kaepernick takes a knee. Right. We want to give respect to people whose ideas are different. What do you think? Yeah, I absolutely love that she said that. I think that's so important. I think it's a tragedy that we as a society have reached a point where we can't respectfully agree to disagree. I mean, there's a change petition going around trying to get him kicked off the NFL. And that's absolutely insane that some, someone is trying to kick him off purely for praising his wife and expressing his values. When, like she said, Black Lives Matter, other issues, that never happens for those types of issues. Fair enough. Um on all points. Uh, interesting where this is headed, especially with the NFL, um, who now is seeing this enormous rise in audience uh, with women. Uh, 58.8 million women watched the Super Bowl this year. Uh, 56% of women and girls in the United States say they're fans of the NFL. Uh, I'll give you the last 20 seconds. Do you think this changes that? I don't think it does. I think that most of the people that tend to watch the NFL probably do lean a certain way. But ultimately, like I am a woman with three degrees. I have a career, but I do aspire to be a mother and a wife. And so I think that ultimately we can have our values and still enjoy sports and we don't have to tie the two together. We can disagree and that's okay. Fair enough. Um, Yeah. Nice to be able to disagree and to accept people who don't agree with you. Noel, thank you very much. I appreciate the perspective. It's good to good to see you. We wrote first about this in War Notes, talked about exactly how the NFL has a problem uh, between the values it professes and the values of the people who are its biggest fans. Warnotes.com to subscribe for free. Here's Chris.